In that gospel text, Jesus said, for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. I hear those words, and I think, those who want to save it will lose it, and those who lose it will save it. I don't know about you, but to me that really sort of sounds wrong. I must have missed something somewhere. This reading, for me and maybe for you, ranks right up there with some of the other Bible texts that may leave us scratching our collective heads when we read them or hear them. I think this verse could be placed right beside that parable of the vineyard workers. You remember that one, where the people that came and worked for only an hour got the same amount of money as the ones that had worked all day. That just doesn't make sense to us. So, let me set up this reading for this morning so we can be better able to understand what Jesus is telling us. So often our reading only includes a certain amount, but there's something really important before or after it. Well, just before the start of today's reading in Mark, we have what's called the Confession of Peter or Peter's Declaration about Jesus. Jesus asked his disciples this very important question. He wanted to know, who do the people say I am? They've been out preaching and teaching for quite a while, and Jesus wonders, who do the people think that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. Now, you know, Christ means the anointed one, and the word for that in Hebrew is Messiah. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. And in the Matthew and Luke versions of this same story, Jesus says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I don't know if you realize that Peter is really from Petra, and Petra also means rock. So on this rock I will build my church, Jesus said to Peter. This picture should show Jesus, or Peter there, yeah, with the keys to the kingdom. I've not used the screen behind me, so I have to look up and make sure it's really there. So <laughs> if I said this and you were going, I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, so you see, whenever you see a picture of Peter, he's almost always either holding keys or he has keys hanging from his belt because of the fact that Jesus said, I will build my church on you, he is considered to be one who holds the keys to the kingdom. So what an exhilarating time this probably was for Peter. Jesus had asked him a very important question, and Peter, he nailed it. I mean, he nailed it. He said exactly the right thing. But you remember what Jesus said to him? He told Peter that God revealed that answer to him. So Peter, at this point, is feeling really high and maybe even thinks he has finally gotten a real understanding of Jesus and his purpose here on earth because, quite honestly, the disciples still weren't sure exactly what Peter was or what Jesus was going to do and how he was going to do it. So Jesus takes this opportunity to reveal to the disciples that he will have to undergo great suffering and that he will even be put to death and that he will rise again three days later. And you remember the disciples, after Jesus was put to death, they forgot about that rising again three days later. The text even tells us that Jesus told his disciple this quite openly. That means that he wanted to hide nothing from his followers. He wanted them to know what was on the horizon. So up to now, in this particular biblical story, Jesus has been preaching his message of the kingdom of God throughout Galilee. Now, if you know anything about the Holy Land, Galilee is up north. It's by the Sea of Galilee, or Lake Tiberias. It's a beautiful, lush area if you've ever been to the Holy Land. But the other part that they were going to now was Judah, where Jerusalem and Jericho and some of those places are. Not, not lush, not green, lots of rocks, lots of dust. And throughout Galilee in his ministry, he was known as a worker of wonders. He did fantastic things. He had healed many, many sick people. And he had twice fed multitudes of people with only a few loaves and fish and he had even raised people from the dead. So through these miracles, Jesus had demonstrated great power over the laws of nature and over the demons that he found. So they'd been teaching and preaching, the disciples along with Jesus, for a while now, and they probably felt giddy with the exceptional uh, response that they'd been getting from the people. They were probably joyful. They had huge crowds. People went away loving Jesus and telling people about Jesus. So they probably wondered, what's next? I mean, it's been fantastic so far. I wonder what could be next. 
I always think about us when I think about these stories, and I wonder what we would have thought if we had been back in this time and following Jesus at this point. Jesus always seemed to want to play down the demonstrations of power in favor of the message that he was preaching. He often told people not to tell anyone about the miraculous things that they had seen or that they had experienced. He wanted the message, the preaching, the message that he was getting to be the central thing that people focused on, not the miracles or the works of power. And you have to realize that at this time in history, just like there is today, there were other people who were miracle workers. Jesus wasn't the only one traveling around at this time, supposedly uh, performing miracles. Some of these people may have truly been able to be miracle people. Other ones were probably fakes, as we have known about in our lives. But he was not the only one going around at this time who supposedly was a miracle worker. The people, and especially the disciples, were expecting the Messiah to be what? A man of power. These people expected the Messiah, the anointed one, to be a heaven-sent descendant of King David, who would come to rule the people of Israel, to rule the people of Israel and save them from their enemies. That's what they were hopeful hopeful for. Perhaps they expected this David-like man would shed the blood of the enemies of Israel and return Israel to to a position of prominence among the nations of the world like they were under King David and Solomon. This is clearly not how Jesus saw himself and his mission. And this is precisely why, I think, we often see and hear Jesus saying and doing the opposite things than what we might expect him to say and do. Because Jesus thinks in a divine way, and we most often think in worldly ways. So we might ask, how does Jesus see himself and his mission here on earth. Instead of shedding the blood of others, Jesus knows he is going to shed his own blood. Instead of killing other people, Jesus knows that he will be killed. Jesus knows he will suffer and die. And he further knows that his death will be the source of life for God's people. Life from death. That's an interesting concept and a difficult concept probably for the people of Jesus' time and even for some today to even understand life from death. As a matter of fact, Peter and we, suppose all of the other disciples, because Peter usually spoke for all of them, he refuses to believe that this suffering and death is necessary. That's understandable. They'd been having a very positive time, doing wonderful things, and now their leader says, I'm going to suffer and die. They didn't want to think that was true, so somehow Peter, being very careful and well-minded, says to Jesus, and it tells us that after he had taken them aside, so not in front of the other disciples, and I'm going to sort of paraphrase what I think it is that Peter was thinking and may have said something like this to Jesus. No, it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to die. We are here with you, and we have some power. We've got a lot of people behind us at this point. Don't you realize how popular you are? We have accumulated a lot of power from the people who follow you. Let's just keep doing what we've been doing, and we will stay popular and powerful, and we will further the cause of Israel. And maybe, just maybe, we will gain control of our fortunes again and our future. You are the man, Jesus. You maybe don't realize it, but you're the man. Let's just keep doing as we've been doing. I think we'd have to give Peter an A, at least, for intestinal fortitude, or guts, as we used to say, because he had just been complimented by Jesus for answering that Son of God question perfectly. So he figures he can maybe contradict Jesus and say, no, you don't have to die. And I would think that Peter expected Jesus to say something like this, because he thought this was going to be a positive thing to tell Jesus, no, we can do it a different way. He probably thought Jesus would say, well, Thank you very much, Peter. You have a point there. Maybe I don't have to die, and thank you for pledging your support to me. Maybe you're right. Together, all of us together, maybe we can accomplish what has to be done without that dying thing. That may have been what Peter expected, but actually what happened? Jesus did not compliment Peter on his support. Instead, Jesus said what? Get behind me, Satan. Whoa, just a few minutes ago, Jesus was saying, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and now he is saying, 
get behind me, Satan. What a change. What a horrible change for Peter. Jesus said to Peter, you are setting your mind on human things or worldly things, not on divine things. This is Jesus' way of telling Peter, and us actually, that the way humans often see things is not the way God sees them. Humans do not properly understand God or God's ways all of the time, or maybe even almost any of the time, actually. This thing about divine and worldly is a common theme with Jesus. Humans often, most often probably, think and act in worldly or selfish and evil ways. God wants us to think and act in divine ways. Remember some years ago, especially, WWJD was very popular. What would Jesus do? In this case, I'm going to change it to WWGD. What would God do? That's a way to think in divine ways. What would the loving thing to do be? I was talking with Pastor Ryan this past week, and it came to me. I said, you know what? It's very interesting because in working with this sermon, I realized that those of us who graduate from seminary, we get a master's degree. And you know what that master's degree is in? Divinity. It's not a master's of humanness or a master's of humanity. We are supposedly taught how to come out and preach and teach in a way to help all of us think in a divine way, not a human way. That's huge, and it's very hard for us to do. Fortunately for us, God's true nature is revealed in self-giving love, unconditional love, a love that is willing to go as far as the cross for the sake of the loved ones. And we, my friends, are those loved ones, as are our neighbors. And actually, that's all of our neighbors, not just the ones that we like or the ones that look like us. All those people around us are our neighbors. So Jesus tells us we have to lose our life to find it. I hear something like that or read something like that, and I say, what's that mean then? I mean, it's easy to say that, but it's like, what does that mean for us? The command is to take up one's cross, and it's a command to give up ourselves, not just things. We need to die to self, which is very biblical, that's how it says in Scripture, before we can truly have life with Christ. This touches on what is most important in our lives. Think of your own life, what is most important? Where do we really focus our lives? Some of us focus mostly on self. We are often guided by, mostly by what's good for me. It shouldn't be surprising, though, really, because we do live in the world. We are worldly. We live in a very selfish time and place. This is a society that encourages self-absorption, self-actualization, self-advancement, self-assurance, self-improvement, self-interest, self-righteousness, meaning to believe in self, and self-fulfillment. Is it any wonder that we set our sights on being healthy, wealthy, and wise? We live in a world that often says, Have faith in yourself. What do people think of oftentimes? What's in this for me? Cheryl and I went to a conference, my wife Cheryl and I went to a conference or an assembly some years ago, an ELCA thing, and when we got to that, we were all given a button. And it said, what's in me for this? Whoa! Just switching those two words, what's in this for me and what's in me for this, changes that totally. And it's the description of the difference between selfish and selfless. Wow. Jesus would have us all be God-centered. First and foremost, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors as yourself. It's a matter of emphasis and focus in our lives, my Christian sisters and brothers. We are to focus on loving God and our neighbor with a healthy self-love. We have to love ourselves enough to keep ourselves uh, healthy and able to do and say the things that God wants us to do. And then we will be right with God. That's the definition of righteousness. People who are right with God are considered to be righteous. And it is said in our second lesson for today that you heard read from Romans 4 when speaking of Abraham's faith in God. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Our faith can be reckoned to us as righteousness. We've got to lose that part of us that doesn't put God first in order to find ourselves. I've got written down here, say that again. That's an important sentence. We've got to lose that part of us that doesn't put God first in order to find ourselves, in order to find that self that God wants us to be. 
And although it may not always be very easy, we can be assured that the gifts of joy, peace, love, and life are there for us as righteous followers of God. Jesus says to Peter, and I think to us today as well, get behind me, Satan. Now what that can mean is to get in step behind me. Think in a divine way. It means do the things that God would have us do, not the things that Satan is, keeps trying to have us do. As Pastor Ryan mentioned two weeks ago in his message, and even last week again in his message, he referred to 1 Peter 5 where it says, Satan prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him steadfast in your faith. So anyone that thinks that Satan only existed back then and doesn't exist anymore, you're wrong. Satan is still here. I think one of the biggest times and places Satan is involved in our lives, especially we Americans, is on Saturday night when the kids ask mom and dad, are we going to church tomorrow? And the answer often is, oh, I don't know, we'll decide in the morning. That's a way of saying, no, we ain't going. We're not going. That's the time when it's so important for us to realize that if you grew up like I did, there was never a question of whether you're going to church. It was only a question, are you going to 8 or 10.30? And you're going to Sunday school in between. That's Satan is out there trying to make us do the things that Satan wants us to do. Maybe we will not always fully understand why God wants us to do this or that, but we will follow nonetheless. And if you wonder, is this something God wants me to do? My wife says this, and I think it's just right on. Is it the loving thing? If it's the loving thing to do, then that is the right thing to do. Let's pledge ourselves, my friends, during this Lenten season to walk behind Christ down this perilous, risky path that leads to the cross, knowing that both God and Jesus are with us on that path. We should joy to lose our lives to Christ so that we may find them confident that along the way we will always be supported by God's love and God's light. Let's start asking, what's in me for this? Amen.